Hello everyone, welcome to the Lung Lang Show. What is good touch and what is bad touch? What does sexual abuse imply? Today we have with us two very special guests who will help me discuss good touch, bad touch, which is an issue on sexual abuse faced by women. And we have a special guest, Advocate Abila Sangdam, Advocate Gohadi High Court, Kohima Bench. And she's also a retaining lawyer, Naglin State Legal Services Authority and legal consultant to the Department of Welfare, Social Welfare, Government of Nagaland. And next we have Gracie Aye, State Mission Coordinator and State Hub for Women Empowerment in the Social Welfare Department. And she has worked in the areas of women empowerment and women development for the last 12 years. And today we'll be talking about sexual abuse mostly faced by women being International Women's International Week. And there are many implications when it comes to um, sexual abuse faced by women. So sexual abuse does not really necessarily confine to women alone. However, it is also faced by men folk, men faced by boys, and so on. So however, our focus will be on women issues for tonight. Thank you to both of you for joining in this conversation. And I'm very excited that you know we get this time to have this conversation. So <laughs> You know, I, want, I would like to really, really understand on the concept of the good touch and the bad touch. As a man, we never got to understand in the past like, uh, there, there, that there is a concept called good touch and bad touch. And men, most of them fail to understand when someone touches a woman, when they feel bad or when they don't like it, it could be just good, bad touch or whatever way you would like to define. So can I hear from both of you, like what do you, how do you, how would you like to define good touch and bad touch? Uh, yeah, well, um, firstly, I'm glad to be here this evening in this very important uh, talk and conversation. Uh, maybe um, precisely if we, when we talk about uh, good touch and bad touch, particularly we, when we talk to the kids or the children, below 18 years for that matter. Mm. Um, when we explain to them all the provisions and all the things, we define in a simple way that anything, any touch that is not uh, comfortable. For instance, we talk on the anybody touching uh, your private parts for that matter. Private parts involve the mouth, the chest part, um, and your private parts. And so these are those areas, if somebody touches your private parts, that is bad touch. And for generally for the adult, anybody touches with good intention and bad intention also, that also has to be identified. Mm -hmm. Also, any touch that is uncomfortable mm -hmm. and letting you to feel uh, embarrassed for that matter, uh, that is a bad touch. So in simple way, we will be talking along in a conversation, but that is how anything that is uncomfortable, that is a bad touch. So that is how uh, we define in a nutshell. Great. To add to what uh, Apila has shared, since uh, you, we are also going to be talking about sexual abuse of various kind, sexual abuse, uh, specifically since it's on uh, good touch and bad touch, it involves a physical contact. But let me add that abuse can happen even without a physical contact as well. So in addition to what um, he has said, good touch and bad touch is a simplified version of letting even a kid understand what abuse is. So good and bad, whatever you feel good, you know, you feel safe, you feel, uh, you feel comfortable, like uh, a pat on your, uh, on your shoulder, like a handshake, a fist bump, or a friendly um, hug, a bear hug, all those can be considered a good touch. Bad touch is exactly the opposite. If, you, if you're feeling hurt, it can be a physical hurt as well, like somebody bullying you, hitting you, punching you. It can also be uh, anything that makes you feel scared, feeling uncomfortable, feeling unsafe. You know, all those uh, is a simple way of letting them know what bad touch is. Uh, let, letting children know what a bad touch is. You'll be surprised to know I also got to know this concept only after I started studying about social issues, mm -hmm. only after I uh, started working in the development sector. But as a kid growing up, this concept were not introduced to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the little that we got to know about the different 
private parts that we are talking about is also from the uh, little uh, chapter that we had as a reproductive uh, science subject, you know, on reproductive health. Um, that's how we got introduced. But otherwise, even among our parents or our teachers would never really tell us that this is good and this is bad and that you should do something about it if you're not feeling good or feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful. And how would you normally differentiate between good touch and bad? Suppose I'm a man and suppose, in, you know, uh, for instance, I touch a woman with a good intention, but she turns out to be not liking it. Like it's way too much. You have been touching very often, very frequently, and it's turning to, you know, kind of a toxic. It has become toxic. That kind of the, in, regardless of how much good my intention may be, it can possibly turn into you know, a bad touch that someone feels embarrassed. So how would you react to such um, instances? For example, you have a colleague who would normally come and say, touch you, you know, in a very friendly way, but in, in, in the point, at some point of time, you get tired of it and you feel embarrassed when he comes and just have that physical contact with you. Mm. Yeah, you know, touch has got the social cultural context as well. Yes. What is good here may not be uh, necessarily good in, in mm. say, example, in, in say Delhi. Okay, so it has got a, we have to keep in mind the social cultural context. Mm. Like, for example, we don't uh, necessarily cover our head, but in, in interior parts of India, you'll see people covering their head. So that's what I mean to say, the cultural aspect of it. So um, first of all, uh, it, it all depends on the kind of relation that you have with that person. You know, so the same hug that I'm hugging with my immediate best friend or my mother, I will definitely not feel comfortable when uh, somebody of a, uh, of a, um, you know, somebody whom I'm not very comfortable with do the same thing. Let me uh, emphasize here, it all depends on the kind of uh, hierarchy, okay, or the kind of bond that you have with that person. And abuse of any form is an exertion of power. I think I'm getting a little technical here, but in simple words, if you're feeling uncomfortable and I say no, okay, or if I have the courage to be able to say no, you know, and that person still continue to do it, that is abuse, mm. all right? But then if I'm unable to say no, then the abuser, who is in a position of power mostly, yeah. would be continuing to take advantage of it. Mm. So I've heard many instances, even in, uh, you know, educational setting where some teachers are like very touchy-touchy. Some faculties are very touchy touchy, and maybe they are doing it in the name of uh, sometimes they even use God, you know, oh, God bless you, or whatever. <laughs> it's very funny, mm -hmm. but the, the student is not comfortable to tell the teacher that I'm not comfortable with it. But, you know, somehow I've been working in this woman, they come and tell me, you know, that this happened, I don't know what to say. A few people who come to me, I, I tell them how you should say no. But this teacher or faculty uh, of a higher higher rank kinds of continues to do that not necessarily uh, maybe she herself maybe he himself is not aware that he's doing something wrong as well right. you know so that is just a very small instant of uh, what good, good touch can mean it, can, it, will, it will define the definition will change yeah, with the kind yeah. of relationship with the culture with the, with the social context, the context yeah. now you, you, what you shared just had made things clear like it doesn't matter what my intention is when the person who is being touched is not comfortable it turns it's always a bad touch right so intention is very secondary to this the primary thing is like um, the comfort the comfort level of the person you know the feeling that you know what kind of feeling that he she gets when she's being touched by any man or you know now i feel like uh, recently there is a kolkata high court which um, made a judgment that even calling someone a, a stranger a darling is a sexual abuse let alone touching women Call, calling someone darling is not a sexual abuse. Has it? Do you think that has been fetched or overstretched so far, or is reasonable to, you know, call it a sexual abuse as a woman? What do you think? Well, uh, in simple way, see if you have to talk about the comfort zone or the comfortability of a person, as mentioned rightly, like anything toxic is bad mm. for that matter drinking eating to you know uh, talking to anything which anything that is excess or toxic is a bad thing similarly in, in in the good touch and the bad touch situation also for instance like any person cannot just come and 
you know, pat you or, you know, touch your body during meeting hours or any discussion going on important thing. A person touches a, another person, the opposite gender, because of having something or the other in his mind, number one. Now, coming back to the discussion on the Calcutta High Court, um, um, nothing much to give an opinion, but uh, that makes sense also for me, because that covers under 354, outreaching the modesty. Right. So we cannot just call like uh, simply anybody, anybody, anywhere, you know, darling, Jeez. or, you know, that is outreaching the Sexy. modesty, actually. You know? So, I mean, that is a well-settled law, actually. Okay. I mean, that is justified so much, and for that matter, an eye-opener also, because anywhere in the market, anywhere in the office, darling, jigs, what else and what not, all these, uh, all these words which are actually abusing, okay. abusive rather. And so, um, as for me, I will, I will not be in a position to comment or give my opinion, uh, but um, this is very much in line to Section 354 of the IPC. Okay. Do the same thing. Who calls you darling is the question. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, but the Calcutta High Court, the recent one is a stranger calling you a, you know, it's, it would be the same like when a stranger calling me, hey, Chinky. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can relate to that. You know, a man will think, what's so wrong with, you know, calling someone a darling? It's just a verbal thing. You're not hurt. You're not physically touched. But it's the same as probably someone calling me, Hey, Jinky, hey, Chinese, you know, all these terms. Yeah. Definitely, I think it involves emotional things, emotional aspects, like when someone calls you names that you don't like to hear, right? So that's, that's wonderful. Now, when we come back to the context of Nagalim, our, I don't think people are aware enough of these implications of, like, or the issue of uh, touching someone, um, you know, against her will or, because I think the, 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 the reason is we're not taught about this. And as an adult, this is, very, this is, this is you know, something that I learned very, very recently. That, okay, when you touch a woman, you have to be very careful. You know, there, are, there is something called the good and the bad. And the bad, everyone should avoid. And when a person doesn't feel comfortable, you should not even try to touch. You know, your, your intention may be good, but you have to avoid all of that. Now, in our society, we are not, sensitized enough about this. So do you, what do you think? Are good touch or good touch is fine. Let it happen anywhere. But the bad touch, is it happening in our society? Or from your personal experience or what, which, from whichever angle you want to bring this in? I would say 101% this is happening in the state of Nagaland. Those days we've been hearing from television, mm -hmm. news only, that outreaching of modesty of women is happening, rape and murder is happening, Sexual harassment is happening elsewhere, mm. but today there is very much cases, you know, existing in the state of Nagaland also. And I've been I've been sharing this my mind to uh, in in many of the platforms. But even today, I want to make it very uh, loud and clear that we need sensitization. We mm. need awareness on these issues. Mm. Only a few years now, we are, we are coming to know about good touch and bad touch. For that matter, talking about good touch and bad touch is something a restriction for us in our society. Mm. But now that you know things are happening in our own kitchen, uh, very much that sensitization has to be has to be done. Mm. Spread you know spread awareness as much as possible in all the platforms, speaking the starting from the uh, family talks to the institution uh, to the different uh, public platforms in the government level as well. That this needs to be discussed. Thoroughly and awareness should be um, spread out um, everywhere in, in the yeah. community. Yes, Gracie, what do you think from the social perspective, from the social angle? Mm -hmm. Do you think bad touch can also happen within the family? It is happening against the sister, against the daughter, or definitely, definitely. How yes. does that happen? I just to give a global perspective first, a little one, because to, to kind of let people be aware that this is a global problem mm -hmm. and not specific to Nagaland or okay. not specific to our home alone, that it is happening everywhere and that it's okay to report and it's okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so globally also uh, the World Health Organization data uh, uh, mentioned that about 20% of the boys 
okay? 20% of the girls have been sexually abused, and girls means minor, and about 5 to 10% of the boys, okay? The minor boys have been also a victim of sexual abuse, mm. and that one in every four girls, okay? One in every four girls and one in every seven boys are sexually abused. Now, this is specific reference to the to, to uh, children, and uh, I would also want to categorize the minor, the women, the girls, and the and the um, women, the adult above eighteen as well. Children are most vulnerable because one, adults don't take them very seriously. Two, they um, in the sense they don't even they're not even aware. But at the same time, I guess there's a lot of uh, uh, fear, stigma, shame being attached with it because of which the cases are very uh, underreported. So the kind of cases, we have our one-stop centers established in 11 districts of Nagaland. So we have got over 1,000 cases of women in different uh, distress situations, out of which about 50% are related to crimes related to women and children. Now this is one-stop center, mostly caters to women. So this is data related to women only, but we will get more uh, you know, data from the child uh, child helpline 1098, which is established in um, in uh, in Nagaland as well. But in our one-stop centers that caters to women specifically, this is the kind of information we we got. The nature of cases, the exact number, that's why it cannot be quantified because the the severity and the uh, the clandestine nature in which it happens, you know, it is uh, it is uh, very concerning. So the kind of cases we got, as you rightly mentioned, we have got cases of father raping a daughter. Uh, and it happened for two, three years, and then only after she can't take it anymore, she's telling somebody, you know, in this case, a mother. Mm -hmm. so raping, is, raping is very well, you know, a cognitive The extric, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. So the point comes to touching, like a bad touch within the family. Did yeah, exactly. Yeah. Raping is the extreme form, and besides that, again, there is different form of molestation and different kind of touch that is happening out there. But the rape is like the extreme form where, where Nagaland state, our society has reached to that level. Mm -hmm. Brother raping a sister, very recent case, uh, Dimapur police was handling that. Then, of course, most of these victims, especially children, as I said, they're most vulnerable, happens by people, 80-90% is by people known to them. And there are social factors to it, which we'll discuss later, but it's known to them in the form of your uncle, your, your cousins, mm. right? Your cousin, brother, somebody who is staying with you. In Naga culture, we have so many extended relatives yeah. staying in our family because we are very community-oriented, you know, a collective uh, uh, kind of community we have, you no? Know? We help others. So it, uh, those are people who are supposed to be caretakers, responsible for taking care of the children. That time, sometimes it can even be in the form of a nanny, it can be form of a, your drivers around, your different people around, touch you, molest you, and you're not even aware that this is a bad touch and that I should be telling somebody, yeah. you know? You feel, very you, feel, you feel very uncomfortable. And then the abusers use uh, tricks like, you know, a threat, sometimes a force, Sometimes they bribe you with sweet. Ch children can be just bribed with a lollipop as well, no? Or, or they kind of uh, uh, keep it as like a good secret, bad secret. Mm. The most easy technique is to kind of, you know, fool the children. It's a bad secret. It's a secret between us. You shouldn't be telling them, you know? Mm. So these are the kind of cases that is happening globally, even in India and definitely in Nagaland as well. Just to substantiate that, you know, even the NC NCRB record of 2023, it is out of the 22 cases that has been reported um, um, within the state of Naglin, 17 cases are, the offenders are people known to them, people known to the victims. Out of how much? Out of 22, 22 cases 17 cases. Out of the 22 cases registered, 17 cases, in the 17 cases, the offenders are known to the victims. Wow. And only five are the strangers. See, that is the level of uh, you know, abuse and the offenses happening in the state of Nagaland. This is really alarming. This very really shocking alarming. information. You know, what we, thought, what we teach our, our children normally in, in our society, don't talk to a stranger, mm -hmm. they're very dangerous. Exactly. We, never, we never teach our children, be careful talking to your uncle in a, exactly. at a very inappropriate place, in appropriate time. Mm -hmm. You know, then these all points of, I mean, instructing or creating sensitization for our children should also reflect back to our own family members, to our own relatives, people who are known to us. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily always focusing on the strangers who are, who's, who are always uh, termed as bad people because we don't know them. Mm 
Okay. Right. Yeah, and in some cases, they are the most uh, religious people. One of the abuser was a 70-year-old man, example, a neighbor, who is like such an uncle figure, right? Children look up to them as an yeah, uh, uh, uncle figure. But then what happens behind closed doors is something that no mm -hmm. one knows. Exactly. They, they take them in some secluded place where when the children are not around or when the parents are not around. Or we also in our goodness, our society in our goodness, we just said, oh, uncle Lagorde Jawi, auntie mm. Lagorde Jawi. You know, it's it's don't know what can happen. yes, and in some cases, in a lower uh, economic uh, strata of some family, they just go to neighborhoods place to watch television. Mm. Yes. True. True. Abuse happens there. Exactly. You know? Wow, this is quite alarming. I was not even aware of this um, possibility of happening within the family much, mm. although I heard about some cases. Yeah. However, the data that you guys shared yeah. is just one. It's just like mm. amazing. Many people will not be aware also because as uh, uh, people uh, working for the welfare of the children and women, we mostly respect the privacy of the of the client, of the victim. Okay. And so we don't normally report it in the media unless it is being known by others and you know, it becomes, in fact, mostly it's a civil society who kind of take it to the press first. Right. Sometimes it has its advantage and disadvantage as well. Like in a case where we were really trying to protect this victim, that particular tribal ho-ho, I may be jumping the topic, but that tribal organization came forward and gave a press release that we condemn, now everybody knows which tribe this girl is from. Mm. Then the another village group came, now everybody knows which person, which village this girl came from. Mm. So we are talking about, for our thing is, our role is not just to report the case, but it's also for the larger rehabilitation of this girl, mm. you know, mm. of the of the, the women that come okay. When they are further victimized because of the society mm. and the stigma attached with it, it becomes a very difficult process. So what is the reporting aspect of it and after that is what happens after reporting. After that, That's a different yeah. challenge altogether. Okay. So now we have come to a point of some conclusion that, or some understanding that, it's very much prevalent even among people whom we know. And that's a big and shocking revelation. And I think our institutions or government or organizations should take a good cognizance of this, especially even the churches, you know, not to leave any minor or anyone who is not aware of the rights and wrongs, you know, uh, in the hands of those perpetrators who can, who has the possibility of perpetrating, you know, um, and, and commit such kind of acts against children. So Abila, I would like to also understand uh, our civil society organizations, like or Naka society in general, we love to settle this kind of cases sometimes under our customary laws. And as we know, customary laws, we don't have that established. It's not a um, uniform civil laws as such. However, it differs from place to place, tribes to tribes. So, and there are instances of people trying to resolve this under custom, customary laws. How does that work? And why it is good, why it is bad? Well, um, if I have to, um, you know, expound it, then uh, I would definitely say that for those cases, for this kind of cases, there are already a well special laws are existing okay. in India, in the country. For instance, we have uh, POCSO, Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act 2012. That covers any offenses, sexual offenses, uh, below the age of 18 years. Now there's another special law called the uh, Sexual Harassment at Workplace um, Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal 2013 where we call it POSH Act. So that is there for those uh, women in the workplace to protect them from sexual harassment. And so I think there should there be a thin line uh, clearly made between the customary laws and the Indian special laws. I'm not demeaning or commenting on the customary laws. Yes, we are special and we are unique. Our culture is unique and we appreciate that and we should uh, um, appreciate that. However, there are certain jurisdictions uh, being drawn by the laws and regulations. And so for that matter, uh, I want to make it a very loud and clear message that uh, for the ho-hos and for the NGOs, we have our own roles and responsibilities to be done and to be carried as much as we have the laws existing to be followed and so um, uh, my message to everyone is that let us make clear of our jurisdiction at the first place to deal with certain offenses and so if that is clear enough 
then I think all things are possible to implement clearly. I think for criminal cases, it's best to go to law enforcing agencies and use these legal mechanisms that are already in place, basically. Yes, yes. And, and for that matter, uh, I think our people, for that matter, I, our people should do away with the so-called compromise or, uh, you know, just, just putting ourselves uh, too meek and weak that our own body are so off or compromise, compromise with you know some amount of money for that matter or for instance like in the name of God I think you know God is a God of justice and so we need to understand it that you know offenders for those offenders there's also a law as much as there is a protection and rights for the victims and so that need to be made it clear Loud and clear. Yeah, I want to highlight the word compromise. It's so common in Nagaland, and with based on the cases that we have got, most of these compromise requests or the idea comes from the immediate family members, extended Correct. family members. Correct. You know that okay, it's your own uncle, it is your own father, it is your own somebody. What will happen to their family? Yeah. Yeah. Leave it. You know. And so much social image, of course, definitely the shame and stigma associated mm. with violence against women and children in general. So then the, the pressure starts with your own family members as well. So when we are so regressive as a society like that, how mm. can we expect a poor child who is so vulnerable or a woman who is already in a very abusive state of mind to kind of push them to a corner without really supporting them, you know? Okay. So the word compromise is something that I will not encourage within a family, within an organization or within a church or any setting as well. And literally anywhere. Anywhere, anywhere. Okay, I mean, that's very discouraging, very discouraging. Um, that shows that, you know, uh, the, the, the nature of the rule of law that we have is still very, very weak. Because we're not ruled by law, we are ruled mostly by compromise when it comes to offenses, as Abila also said. Suppose, Abila, I'm a, I'm a little girl or I'm a little boy and I feel abused by an adult, by an elderly person as a little girl. What would I do or what should the family do? Because that's very, very concerning. Yes. Is FIR the only way or, you know, how cases, how do cases normally get escalated? Now, see. Uh, as I've mentioned also, that uh, for those offenses committed against the children below the age of 18 years, mm. this cover, this is, the offenses are covered under Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act 2012. This act has come into force on, in the, in, in, on 14th of November 2012. That is the Children's Day across, 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 across the country. Across the, across the country. And so, this any offenses that is committed against sexual offenses mm -hmm. uh, sexual offenses committed <coughs> against the children below the age of 18 years this act this special law will apply to them irrespective of anybody be it common servant be it private anybody this act will apply to them now the procedure the simple procedure is that number one the victim is small yeah. it may be two three years five years six years seven years mm -hmm. below 18 so he or she, why I'm mentioning this because POXO Act is gender neutral yeah, absolutely. that covers both female, yeah. male and female, boys and girls. Mm. And so um, the first thing that needs to be done is to lodge a complaint. Mm. Now the, the kid, the, the small uh, girl or the boy may not know where to go. And so there are um, child welfare committees also there in the state of Naglin, mm -hmm. all right, that comes under um, uh, child commission. And so they, they can approach through their elders. And so the, 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 the concept here comes, see, the, 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 this is small boy and girl. They cannot express what has really happened. So they need to go and tell like, this, this, this pet touch has happened to me. Mm -hmm. Then the elders will identify that, oh, this is sexual abuse, sexual offense. Okay. And so that is how they will go to a fire directly also. One option is there. Or they can go through some non-group, non say like the NGOs for that matter or some ho-hos also but the point here is why I have made it clear that there should be a thin, thin line in terms of jurisdiction is that when the victim go to them they should not take the law in their hands exactly. they should not start agitating yeah. or we know the famous case March 5th 2013 lynching mob lynching case in Dimapur 
So we should not take the law into our hands. Rather, they, can, they should go and uh, address this issue or the case to the uh, authorized agency, that is the police. They are the sole authorized agency to register all this case and proceed. And so that is how that is one way. Number two is that if anything happened, this kind of sexual offenses happen in your locality, in your neighborhood, and if you don't file, if you, if you come across and if you don't report it, there is also a punishment. For instance, in my colony or in my locality, if any sexual abuse or offenses happened, and if I come to know and if I don't report, mm. there's at least a minimum of six months punishment is there. Wow. That, is that much stringent the law is, what I mean to say. Yeah. And this POXO talks about different kinds of offenses identified under the act, penetrative sexual assault, mm. sexual assault, so and so forth. Yeah. But the punishment starts from six months for not reporting till up to 20 years to life imprisonment. For that for, oh, for, okay. for, for not reporting that is minimum six months, okay, okay. For the but no. for, the, Perpetrator. for the perpetrators or the accused, it goes up to life imprisonment. Mm. So that is the gravity mm. or that is the contained of the act. And so, um, and number two, for those workplace in workplace, workplace, there's called the Sexual Harassment uh, in Workplace Act 2013. Okay. Under this also, anything that is uncomfortable, awkward, that is called sexual harassment. Even calling, you know, even calling by name very rudely or harshly, that covers sexual harassment in the workplace. But the mechanism in this act, in this 2013 act, the Workplace Act, is that there should be an internal complaint committee, not to the police station. Yeah. Yeah. So there should be an internal complaint committee set up by all uh, uh, institutions, mm. uh, which has more than 10 employees, yeah. and they should complain it, address the grievances to the internal complaint committee, and if it is not addressing or uh, not satisfied, they have appellate authority. So that is the procedure. Mm. So all the establishment, be it private sector or government sector, any institution having more than 10 employees should have this internal complaint committee. One classic example I, will, I would like to mention, the Vodafone company. We all know what Vodafone company. You know, they have quite a lot of number of employees. And it so happened that the uh, court come to know, Supreme Court has notice of have not having internal complaint committee. That is a mandatory direction. So they were slapped 50,000 for not setting up an internal complaint committee. Only 50,000. <laughs> so for, so uh, oh, um, for that matter, for any institution, private or government sector, if you are not having, we should start having this internal complaint committee to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, there are uh, digital ways to report the cases as well now. Yes, yes. Now, uh, initially, in the, in the in the uh, criminal laws that we are following now, in the CRPC, Criminal uh, uh, Procedure Court, not the, the existing one. The existing one, we were not having that much jurisdiction. Uh, zero FIR was there after the nearby case uh, judgment, but that was very limited. Now, the new criminal law that is going to come into force, perhaps that was introduced uh, announced just a few weeks back that it will come into force from 1st of July 2024. Now, the new criminal law says, FIR, for instance, under Section 173 of the CRPC, it says, FIR can be lodged anywhere, irrespective of the jurisdiction. That means, suppose someone committed a crime against my family, let's yes. say in Tamil Nadu, Tamil. I can lodge the FIR here yes. in Kohima. Yes. Very much, very much. So that is, that, that is enlarged the boundary. Yeah. Number two is that very uh, um, interesting provision that they have added is that we can do digital form. We can email, orally also we can uh, file our FIR, yeah. but over the phone, electronically, email through email, any mode, electronic mode we can use and file the FIR. So that is another very interesting provision that is added, you know.
and zero, that's called the, so zero FIR means irrespective of the jurisdiction, we can file our complaint, our lodge the complaint. So that are, these are a few uh, uh, provisions that is coming up, uh, but more so, um, we may not remember all the provisions, but for children below the age, age of 18 years, irrespective of girl and boy, POXO Act applies yeah. for sexual offenses. For the sexual harassment at workplace, the uh, Bosch Act 2013 applies. We're here, we have to go to the internal complaint committee. Yeah. yeah, that is the procedure. And very interestingly, if I may allow to bring that, you know, under the um, uh, POXO Act in Nagaland, we also have a male child also, a victim, mm -hmm. a male child who was sexually abused. Okay. So these are very alarming very alarming and so um, our people we should be well aware of the existing laws and regulations more so time and again i'm repeating but we should know the jurisdiction where to file how to file how to proceed and how to assist the victims as well mm -hmm. many a times the victims don't come out to complain because of the fear of stigma and discrimination yeah. it is a kind of a dapu for our culture but we are no longer in the stone age. We have to go ahead, we have to move ahead. And so the, these are powerful provisions and laws existing. And so we should uh, know it and we should um, yeah, apply it. So from your experience as a lawyer or as an advocate for Kohode High Court Kohima Bench, what if you file an FIR, lodge an FIR in any of the police stations and they refuse to you know, accept that FIR? They, Let's say we don't want to accept this, like some trying to suppress your FIR, knowing that the victim or the accused is related to those police constables. What can we do as a common citizen or ordinary helpless citizens? Because not, that is not nothing, yeah, that's not, not impossible. There are provisions also wherein normally we go to the police station and lodge the FIR yeah. to the officer in charge. If they decline, there's superior officers, mm -hmm. say for instance the SP of that particular district. Yeah. If they decline, we have to go to higher ups. Okay. The higher. So there are steps to be followed also, not necessarily that the OC of the police station declined our um, co complaint to lodge, yeah. then yeah. we finish, end up there. Right, but they don't have, have the right to decline it, right? No, 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 no. no. Okay. They, have to, no right they have to take it by any... They have to. Yeah. They have okay. to register it, actually. I think this is a very important information yes. Yes. because when if people are aware that anybody, any crime, any offense can be registered and lodged as an FIR in the police station, then there will be people will be more scared of the law. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, respect for the law and not committing crime is also good, mm -hmm. but fear of the law is also equally important. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Because people should be afraid of the law. They should be scared when they when they think about the law, mm -hmm. imprisonment, you know, jailing, and I think. The reason I believe many people still commit a crime and offense is because people are not aware of mm -hmm. the implications thereafter. Mm -hmm. To substantiate what he, she has added, we have the Women Helpline 1098 and Child Helpline 181, which is integrated together and mm -hmm. is now called the Women and Child Development Control Room, established here in the state capital. But then wherever you're calling, you can come from your interior district of uh, Kifri, Mon, wherever you're calling from, the, as, as in when you call, our team will be there, both at the district level, also to assist you physically as well, or also for that matter, even through the helpline, our team will be there to guide you how to, how to go about even filing an, uh, a simple complaint or filing, lodging an FIR as well. So please remember these two numbers, the Child Helpline 1098 and Women Helpline 181, which is an initiative of the Ministry of Women and Child Development, mm -hmm. Government of India, and it's being implemented through the Nodal Department, uh, Department of Social Welfare. Well. And this information and you know your un sh sharing your experience and knowledge of all these crimes and um, I mean offenses that can be committed it's very interesting and it's very informative for me as well personally I was not fully aware of all these um, legal implications and social factors that's happened that that can help you know crimes and offenses breed inner society the most important information for me today is like accused people who commit this kind of offense are mostly people who are known to the victim mm -hmm. 
So I think it's a important and wonderful takeaway for me and for definitely for our viewers as well that we have to be very careful when we place a little girl in the hands of someone even we know it could be uncle it could be cousin or it could be relatives so it got to be very careful and because the data is showing that most of the offenses come from 80 percent about 80 percent come from people whom we know so don't warn children only about strangers we should warn about the male members or the ed, you know, exactly, exactly. As you rightly pointed out, it happens at home. It happens in school institutions as well. Okay, by teachers, by caretakers, by fourth grade workers, peon chogidar sometimes. All right, or it can even happen in an institutional uh, setup like a hostel, like shelter homes. You know, uh, or it can even happen in the community, the neighborhood that I was talking about. Even in the church, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Because church is a place where we trust the most, mm -hmm. but we, it can't be ruled out that it cannot happen there. Yeah, any right? private or public space. Exactly. Any space that becomes private, there is, yeah, you know, it, it becomes very vulnerable, exactly. you know, situation. So before we conclude this, um, do you have any final thoughts? Quick final thoughts. Well, uh, to summarize and um, you know, to, to, to uh, close down. I have one more thing that I would like to mention is that, you know, under the POCSO Act, for that matter, under the POCSO Act, the Supreme Court, the Apex Court in the country, has even directed the concerned state high courts to monitor the cases under POCSO that is happening in the trial court. Okay. So that is the level of of stringent laws that are existing in our country. And so my message to everyone is that we should no longer be having that kind of feeling that uh, what if I complain, what if I um, make it public? How about my image, my family, my villagers, my tribe, so and so forth. Instead of that, let us come up, let us open up ourselves let us come up and be a mouthpiece for somebody, for that matter, or uh, for that matter, let us let us be bold enough um, that you know, uh, having in my mind, having in our mind that there are still laws and regulations that will protect us. Yes. Also, last and final, we need to have that sense of uh, spreading awareness from the family, starting from the family to the uh, schools, colleges churches as well and do the uh, community yeah that is my message wonderful this topic is so interesting i want to go on talking but it's a very sensitive topic but as apila said we must continue to talk at home at schools wherever uh, there is uh, you know an opportunity to talk about it and uh, and the good news is we have our uh, helpline centers, as I earlier mentioned, and also the District Hub for Empowerment of Women is established in 16 districts of Nagaland in the premises of the district hospital. We have one-stop center at in 11 all districts at the moment, but helps are already available. These things were not available some uh, 10 years back, but it's available now, so report. The NCRB data, which our friend Apila shared, is just the cases that were officially reported. Exactly. And we are exactly. one, Nagalin is one of the safest in the country, one yeah. of the safest state in the country. But based on the field experiences and the kind of victims that come to us, just for counseling, just for overnight shelter, and don't tell anybody about it, you know? And we have to respect, we have to, you know, we do whatever we do, we take the consent of the client who comes to us. So these are not the real reflection of real cases. So many unreported cases are happening. So if you don't report, if you are a victim listening to this uh, talk, if you are a victim and uh, you are not wanting to tell about it or, or seek help, know that this abuser or this perpetrator is going to go around abusing so many other people as well. So we must definitely come forward and start reporting. And as a society, let's stop stigmatizing. Let's stop stigmatizing the victim. Let's give more, be more, uh, create more conducive environment when a victim a, a vulnerable child, a vulnerable woman come to us seeking help. Sure. So thank you to both for your wonderful insights. I'm sure many people will feel benefited from this um, short conversations and it will help the victims or the future possible victims. And don't take this information very lightly. 
It's a very, very important information and keep it with you and stand out for your right. And when you're abused, when you are offended, please don't hesitate to report to the right, I mean, channel or even go to the police for your help. Because when you do that, it helps other prevent um, from getting victimized in the same situation. When you don't report it, the same issue keeps happening and it keeps increasing. And we don't become the safest necessarily the state in the country. So the myth of being the safest state may not be true. So let's work on this together. And I hope they will always be ready to help anyone that needs help. Thank you so much, everyone.